Three weeks ago, we began a short series of messages relating to the eternal nature and presence of God's Holy Spirit, placing our emphasis on achieving a greater understanding of the Spirit's role in our lives today. And for the benefit of some out on the stream that might be just joining us, I want to begin this morning with an overview that highlights what we've learned over the past two weeks. We started out with a goal of sort of leveling the playing field for any believer, regardless of spiritual knowledge or, or maturity, by establishing a kind of a mutual baseline understanding of an important spiritual concept known as the Holy Trinity of God. And using scripture, we established that throughout eternity, past and present, God is seen acting in three distinct persons. And those three persons are God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And while each member of the Trinity plays a unique, uh, unique role in divine matters, all three act together as one living God who is the creator of heaven and earth. So consequently, all three are inherently eternal, almighty, unchangeable, infinitely powerful, wise, just, and holy. Therefore, if the specific goal of our study is to gain a better understanding of the Holy Spirit, we must first acknowledge that rather than a mystical power or influence, the Holy Spirit is a distinct and recognizable spiritual person. And in part one of the series, we confirm that personhood uh, using Scripture. First, Scripture, New Testament and Old, consistently throughout the Bible, references the Holy Spirit with the use of a personal pronoun such as he, his, or him, and that makes it grammatically impossible to understand the Holy Spirit as being anything other than a person. Second, Scripture also reveals that in his true nature as a person, the Holy Spirit can be grieved, the Holy Spirit can be quenched or restrained through actions that hinder his work in our lives, he can be resisted, and finally, he can also be insulted. And you may want to write down these scripture references that's up on the screen so that you can take a closer look at those later and, and see where that's coming from. Before we move into a summary of what we learned in the second week of this series, I want to show you something that uh, relates to the Holy Trinity that the Spirit himself placed in my path just a few days ago. Uh, let's take a quick look at, at two passages of Scripture. And the first passage is found in John 14, 12 through 7, which is the same Scripture from the Gospel of John that we centered on last week, so you'll recognize this. In that Scripture, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Now let's compare what Jesus says in this scripture with what that we've just read with what he says later in John 16, 5 through 7. In this scripture, Jesus says, But now I'm going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking, Where am I going? Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. So in John 14, Jesus says, the Father will give you the Holy Spirit. And in John 16, Jesus says, I will send him to you. So to that point, when we combine all the scripture representing the conversation taking place in the final hours before Jesus was arrested, once again, we see a picture of God acting in three distinct persons. In other words, both God the Father and Jesus the Son are involved in sending the indwelling Holy Spirit. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 tells us that in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. 
The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. When God sent Jesus into the world as a human, Jesus completed God's revelation of himself by using divinely inspired words and performing tangible miracles, concluding with the work of the cross is completed on the day of resurrection. And those who witnessed these events did so externally using five God-created physical senses. After the risen Jesus ascended to heaven, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit arrived as promise to assume the role of a continuous revelation of God to man through an internal spiritual presence in the life of believers. Therefore, through all the things that, that we've learned so far, we can conclude that the external activity of the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, the eternal activity of the Holy Spirit, is never isolated from the person and works of Jesus Christ, nor is it ever isolated from the eternal will of God. In last week's message, we centered on the role that the Holy Spirit plays in the continuous grace we receive through our God-given faith in the completed work of the cross. And we begin that process by simply defining the indwelling of the Spirit as the action by which God takes up permanent residence in the life of those who follow the risen Jesus. Divine in nature, this so-called indwelling is a one-time and forever spiritual event that simultaneously occurs with two other permanent acts performed by the same Holy Spirit as we place our eternal trust in Jesus. So in essence, as the Spirit gives us the faith to believe as fact that Jesus, the perfect Son of God, was offered up as payment for the penalty of our sins, that same Spirit also conceals our flesh nature and the righteousness of Jesus, thereby serving as a lifelong, renewable source of continuous eternal salvation. Amen? To further solidify our understanding of the significance of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we noted that in Old Testament days, rather than permanently setting up shop in the lives of men and women whom God deemed righteous, the Holy Spirit temporarily entered certain individuals, uh, empowering saints and prophets and the like for specific services to God. And once the Holy Spirit's purposes had been served, the Holy Spirit didn't necessarily hang around with these individuals. Old Testament scripture suggests that these saints were well aware of that possibility. We're going to look at an example of someone who clearly understood the temporary nature of the pre-Jesus version of the Holy Spirit indwelling. The Bible tells us that God had a special affection for a man named David. Y'all ever heard of David? God himself described David as a man after my heart who will do my will. So what was it that God saw in David? First, David trusted God without question. In fact, at the beginning of the 25th Psalm, David says, Oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Second, David loved the laws that revealed the character and precepts of God. In Psalms 1, 19, 97, David says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate it on it all day long. God eventually chose David to replace King Saul and become the king of Israel. And scripture in 1 Samuel 16 says that as David was officially anointed, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully among him. But the Bible also tells us that rather than a, a perfect man like Jesus, David was a man like any other man, and he sinned against God in some very significant ways. So we might ask again, why did God love and bless David so much? And while we could start a brand new message series on that very subject, simply said, God loved David because God chose to love David. And while we could start, you know, these messages again, you know, to this point, after going on a sin rampage that included adultery and murder, David prays a prayer of repentance that reveals a clear understanding of the temporary nature of the Old Testament Holy Spirit indwelling. Beginning in Psalms 5.10, as David pleads with God for forgiveness, he prays, 
Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. In this example, while there's no evidence that God ever removed the Holy Spirit from David, it's clear that the unconfessed sin in his life had greatly interfered with the privileged fellowship that God had provided David by the internal presence of the Holy Spirit. Consequently, David was in fear that God might remove his spirit entirely. However, in this case, once David confessed his sin to God, he received forgiveness and his joy returned. But the Bible also provides examples of people whom the Holy Spirit left entirely, including King Saul and Samson, and both of those guys lived much of their remaining lives in misery. Finally, after noting that there are more than 22 different names used by the writers of the Bible to identify the Holy Spirit, we took the name Spirit of Grace, it's found in Hebrews chapter 10, and we used it to nail down a straightforward understanding of the permanent role the indwelling Holy Spirit plays in our new lives in Christ. So once again, for the benefit of, of those that missed last week, I want to take a minute and, and get you caught up with the rest of us concerning the unending grace that we have received through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In essence, grace is God's favor shown to the unworthy without any cause or reason. Grace gave us Jesus, and grace gives us the Holy Spirit. Without Jesus, there's no deliverance from God's wrath or any hope of heaven. And without the Holy Spirit, we would never recognize God's deliverance from sin or ever become fit for heaven. Simply said, God the Father promised the Spirit to Jesus the Son. Jesus the Son permanently places the Spirit of grace in the lives of all who believe, and the Holy Spirit makes these things known to us. As we move into part three of our Holy Spirit message series, let me acknowledge that as far as I know, all who have gathered here this morning already have some level of understanding concerning the role that the Holy Spirit plays in our eternal salvation. Consequently, in the 17 months that have passed since God called me to shepherd this body, my clear call since day one has essentially been one of a farmhand who is responsible for providing an existing flock of sheep with a healthy spiritual diet that will produce continued growth. And with the later part of our 1 Corinthians study still on my mind, I am convinced that a healthy spiritual diet should not only include a continuous stream of, of biblical instruction, but it also requires a consistent reminder of the essential truth that has brought us salvation. And if you recall in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's exactly what Paul did. In fact, let's take a minute and read part of that. Uh, Paul says, uh, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. When we share the gospel among ourselves... I think, I think the reminder serves as an anchor that helps keep us you know, from drifting apart on these, these highs and lows of these changing tides that you know, are in our personal trials and circumstances. And as we re-experience the gospel together, if we allow the Spirit to serve as God intended, we can enjoy a perfect spiritual fellowship with God the Father through the perfect righteousness of Jesus the Son, placed in us through the perfect Holy Spirit. And this enables us to have a united fellowship with all the parties mentioned above. 
Trust me when I tell you, that, that sounds easy, but it's hard to put that kind of thing in the Word because in some ways the believer's fellowship is kind of like a spiritual version of one of them 1960s hippie love festivals. So now that, that my verbal inadequacy is fully revealed, let's spend our remaining time this morning answering an important question. Over the course of, of my corporate career, I've been blessed by the opportunity to work for more than one manager who, instead of ruling with an iron fist, chose to motivate people whenever possible with encouragement and positivity. Likewise, in, in any circumstance that demanded a correction, these men still brought words that once the teeth marks on your rear disappeared, motivated you to shake it off and aim higher the next time. So back in my manufacturing days, on the typical last day of the shipping month, we were all but killing ourselves to exceed our sales budget, even if by one dollar. And in those days, one of those men I worked for would stand at the end of the assembly line and scream like a high school cheerleader. I can still hear him yelling, ship it, ship it, ship it. And every time I walked past him, he would yell, CD, that's what they called me, that's my first two initials. He said, CD, you're doing a fantastic job with these guys. And every time he said that, I always responded the same exact way. What can I get at Kroger for that? <laughs> and this same dialogue went on between me and him for years. I've spent the last three weeks trying to help you see the infinite value of the internal presence of the Holy Spirit in your personal life as a born-again believer in Jesus. And I'm grateful for the positive reception that these messages have received from some of you as evidenced by your encouraging words after the last two services. But with that said, at this point in our study, I think it's appropriate to move on to another question, a question that more directly relates to where the rubber meets the road. And that question is a spiritual version of the question that I've always asked my manager. Thanks for telling me about the Holy Spirit, but what can I get for that? Let me quickly give you a short version of my answer to that question by simply saying that the indwelling Holy Spirit provides you with an unlimited access to the complete inventory at God's spiritual Kroger where everything God offers is always in stock. And continuing on with this silly little metaphor, the Holy Spirit serves as a spiritual shopping cart that we use for collecting God's daily provision. So what's in your buggy? Let's use the rest of our time today to, to kind of take a, a little more detailed inventory of what the indwelling Holy Spirit provides as you live out your new life in Christ. In John 6, Jesus says, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. The Greek word used in this verse that is translated as the English word draw essentially means to drag. And that same word is used in John 21, 6 to describe the dragging of a heavy net full of fish to shore. Likewise, the same word is also used in John 18:10 when we see Peter draw his sword to protect Jesus from arrest. And finally, the same Greek word is also used in Acts 16, 19 to describe the event when Paul and Silas were being dragged before the city rulers in Philippi. So with these examples, I think we can understand that the net had no part in being drawn to shore. Likewise, Peter's sword had no part in being drawn, and Paul and Silas did not drag themselves before the authorities. Consequently, the same can be said of God's drawing us to Jesus for our salvation. We, we have very little to do with that. God does the drawing, therefore any role we might play is passive. Why is it that God needs to draw us to salvation? I think simply put, if he didn't, we would never come. So, so, Pastor Chris, how exactly does God draw us to Jesus for salvation? In last week's message, we spent a good portion of our time looking at some scripture found in John 14, where Jesus, just hours away from his execution, promises a future arrival of the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
just before that section of John 14, uh, at the beginning of chapter 14, in fact, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Do you know people that talk like that? Yeah. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Now hold on to that word truth in your head for just a second and stay with me for just a minute while I jump ahead to the scripture from John 14 that we've already read this morning and ended with last week. In verses 15 and 16, Jesus says, If you love me, obey my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. And then if we look at verse 17, he finishes up with, He is the Holy Spirit who leads to all truth. So verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then we have the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. So here we have a combined one-two punch of two scriptures that in essence reveal that the Holy Spirit is the New Testament agent of salvation. Pastor Chris was an agent. A quick look in my dictionary defines the word agent as a person who acts on behalf of another person or group. A person who organizes transactions between two or more parties or a person that takes an active role or produces a specified effect. One day last week after leaving the church to head for the house, I stopped up here at Goodwill. And before I left, I ended up buying a pretty nice tripod for my camera. And that was a real good find for me because I got ready to use my old tripod not long ago only to discover that somehow the hinge that, that connects one of the legs to the tripod to the base that the camera sits on had broken in half. And I think everybody understands that a tripod that only has two legs won't stand, effectively making the rest of the tripod useless. As the agent of our salvation, the Holy Spirit gives us Jesus and all the redemption that he has secured for the people of God. Simply said, the indwelling spirit applies the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross to the lives of those belonging to the body of Christ. So our salvation is purposed by the Father, accomplished by the Son, and applied by the Holy Spirit. Consequently, without the Spirit, all that Christ has accomplished brings no value to our lives. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. And then Titus 3.5 says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His great mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Because of his great love and mercy, God the Father sought and purposed our salvation. Our salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone, and our salvation is by his Spirit alone. So again, we have three distinct roles in salvation, played by God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they all work sovereignly and seamlessly together to deliver eternal salvation to sinful men. Yet, despite the Holy Spirit's important and integral role in salvation, I think his ministry is frequently understated. His redemption and, and the illumination of Scripture and, and the, his comfort and his prayers that the Bible says he prays for us, all these things are often placed on the back burner of our new lives in Christ. I think we all understand that the Holy Spirit is necessary for, for a new birth in Christ, but I think we, we, we tend to commonly treat him as functionally irrelevant at thereafter. And beyond that, some tend to perceive the Spirit as an experience generator 
who quenches our thirst for whatever we consider to be meaningful worship while we look for signs that verify that God is with us. Still others see the Spirit as some kind of a dream weaver that we call on after we make plans, and then we count on the Holy Spirit to make whatever our plans are, whatever we come up with, we count on Him to make Him happen. And after all else fails, sometimes we look to the Holy Spirit as a miracle worker who sits on the ready until we mess up our life so bad that we don't have anywhere else to turn to. In a simple statement of truth and purpose, the indwelling Holy Spirit is in us because he enables us to live our lives as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. As we wind down today's message, I want to challenge the members of Ellenwood Oaks Community Church to intentionally do three things this week and see if these things make a difference in your life. Number one, live as people of light. In 1 John 5, 1, the Apostle John writes, This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. And then in Ephesians 5, 8 through 9, the Apostle Paul writes, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. So with the Spirit's help, can, can we do that this week? Can we give that a shot? I think so. Number two, I want to challenge you to live a life of wisdom. In Ephesians 5, 15 through 18, Paul advises us, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this scripture, Paul defines living a life of wisdom by three actions. And those three actions are make the most of every spiritual opportunity, Understand what the Lord wants you to do. And number three, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now wait, Pastor Chris, you, you've said that the Spirit's already living in me. Now this Paul guy says to be filled with the Spirit. So what in the world does he mean? And I'm glad you asked. Uh, to be filled with the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, is a repetitive renewal experience that occurs through repentance. Being filled with the Spirit is something that we must ask God to do, and asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit is what activates the power of the Spirit to work in your life. So giving that in mind, let's, let's give living out a, a life of wisdom a try this week, and let me know how that works out. And then finally, number three, I want to challenge you to live your lives by the power of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 16 through 25, Paul writes, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, self-ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, uh, love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. With all that said, y'all remember to connect, equip, serve, encourage one another. We'll see y'all next week.